The land, in the final analysis, is the prize of war. The aggressor's aim is to capture new land, to turn it to his own use and advantage. From the beginnings of history, the covetous man has eyed neighboring fields rich with natural wealth. In seeking to make the land his own, the first wars were conceived and fought. For defense of the land is the inevitable, almost automatic reaction of the landholder. Battles for farmlands gave way to wars for kingdoms, and then to holocausts fanned by political ideologies. But invariably, the decision to openly employ arms to gain an end is based upon the attacker's desire to capture the land to control the people who inhabit it. The wealth represented by America's farmlands has been joined by an even more obvious symbol of prosperity, the structures which house our industrial giants. Here, the products of the land are refined and transformed into the necessities and luxuries of American life. These are the targets of an enemy for destruction or his own enrichment. No nation is more a network of vast, sprawling cities than the United States. Nowhere do so many people spend their lives in a metropolitan environment. And city living today has taken on a new and potentially hazardous aspect. For this huddling together on the land has made us perhaps the most vulnerable to attack of all the countries of the world. We too much enjoy our way of life to jeopardize it by rash use of nuclear weapons. Our primary purpose in nuclear experiments and military preparedness is to discourage any other power from resorting to war as an instrument of its policy. But should another war be forced upon us, no matter how big the hydrogen bomb, no matter how many guided missiles are launched, the final winning of the war will still be the dirty business of soldier fighting soldier. Cities, industries, and millions of people may be wiped out, but ground troops will have to be sent to occupy the countryside to control any survivors. The land is the army's element. 